technology does exist, and um, we did look at it at the county level in front of schools, so it's a policy decision. And uh, there was no appetite to do it in, in front of schools um, countywide. Uh, there was an appetite to put it, as the chief said, on the school buses, uh, because that was safety for children, and that's something that's just unacceptable to pass a, a school bus, stop school bus. So, and that has, that's rolled out throughout the whole county, and that's been, um, hopefully will prove to be very successful in stopping people from going through, because they're going to get educated when they get that $250 ticket. Right. So they're hopefully going to stop them from doing that again. Um, and the county has the, the red light cameras in the five West End towns, and that's the same sort of technology. That has a video camera, so but if you if you say, oh, I didn't go through that light, there's a record of the car that went through that light. And sometimes they're wrong, sometimes it's not the right car, but for the most part, it gets the license plate. And so the, the technology is there, it's a, it's a policy decision to do that. And that becomes a written into the county law or town law for us to be able to do that. As far as I know, it isn't there yet, so we're not even allowed to do that. The state that. probably has to offer that. <coughs> right. yeah. When you say town law, you mean so the you answer is the answer is let's try it. Try it. Oh, let's try it. Well, uh, uh, so is there a policy will? Is there a policy will? Yeah. What did it say? We're not penalizing the driver. You know that, right? I understand that because I've gotten my share of the car. Right. Right. All right. So there, there is perhaps a follow up to that to find out more information, and, um, and it becomes a, uh, a, a discussion moving forward. Yeah, oh, okay. absolutely, we would look into it. If, if it's a defendable and, and we can prosecute based on that, okay. yeah, I think, I don't know what the cost would be, right. but I can tell you right now, the cost would be worth it, regardless of what it is. Yeah. Uh, the county works on a third party vendor that comes in and does all that, okay. and then the fee is sort of split, the county gets a little okay. share, the, uh, and it gets it gets processed through each of the courts, so by South Hill, so. Yeah, so the, the, in that case, with the school bus camera, the, the vendor gets 45%, because they're the ones who are responsible for the technology and for the cameras, and really for, for a lot of the, the information gathering and, and dispersing <coughs> through the towns. And then, I'm not familiar how it's going with the, locally with the courts, but um, I did get legislation passed to make sure that the East End towns got, got money out of it, and it didn't, um, so, so what you're saying then is if there's a possibility that you'll discuss this in turn and getting more information and and then and it, yeah and it didn't happen overnight with the right. school bus you know it yes. took a long time to find the, the proper vendor and, okay. to, and to figure out how the money was going to be split up afterwards because that's right a, that's a that's a complicated factor too thank you thank you so there's one more let me just put in this traffic uh, one as well, and then we'll go to you, and then uh, uh, more questions in another topic. So this was a question sent in. Presently, there are five major development projects on the East End. The Enclaves, Peconic Bay Winery Resort Hotel at the old Capital One building. No, Peconic Bay Winery Resort, a hotel at the old Capital One building, Brickman's and Strong's storage buildings. While each proposal requires its own independent traffic study, shouldn't there be a comprehensive traffic study to assess the cumulative impacts of all of these major projects? Well, we've done traffic study as a traffic study historically. Um, the reality is, is that business investment is going to create traffic. Now, I'm not endorsing any of those projects or saying good or bad, but I'm saying the traffic studies themselves are pretty expansive. I mean, in one instance, there was a traffic study in Southall that required an analysis of traffic that was as far as two miles away. So, it, you know, they picked the circumstance, they picked the place, and I think you, you understand as a planning board member that a lot of thought is put into what is going to be the radius of the area that has to be studied. Uh, but a town-wide study, since applications change on a regular basis, uh, you could do a study every time you get a new application for a project. That's very, a little bit cumbersome. Or a change in the application. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, please stand up and state your name and your question. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Elaine McDuffie, and I live on Peconic Bay Boulevard. And um, many, many years ago, when we got the first grants, in Southall Town, uh, 
we tried to put a traffic calming device in at the light in Qatar. And the DOT was ready to go. They had $20,000 worth of bricks. And um, it was just a little mild little uh, visual that would slow the traffic down. We were not able to get that through because the fire department didn't want it. So um, when you've got to be careful of some of the things that you think is, are a no-brainer uh, because uh, they, they don't always turn out that way. But uh, tonight I'd like to address uh, Chief Hager Miller because we already had a little discussion a couple weeks ago about uh, buses and trucks and so on on Pecan State Boulevard. I live on Pecan State Boulevard. And uh, we know where they get on. They don't need ways anymore, as the lady said. <clears throat> they know where they're going. And we do have people who direct traffic, and they have no problem with directing, you know, directing the buses, you know, onto Pecan State Boulevard. They don't, you know, it's not unusual. <coughs> Their job, they feel, is to just speed the traffic along. So what's the question? Um, I suggested that perhaps we could have some signs where these vehicles are getting on to Pecan State Boulevard or to Hubbard Avenue, wherever they get on, up at the main road. Uh, I have seen them in other places where there are, <clears throat> there's a silhouette of a bus or a truck or a limo with a red line through it. And it, you don't have to think very long and hard about what that sign means. And it should be in every place that we know of, in both directions, where they're coming and going, they should not be on the boulevard. And I saw six buses in two weekends, and I just happened to see them. Um, I wasn't out looking for them. So would you like the chief to address that? Right, so I we, li we like your sign suggestion. Yeah, we like your sign suggestion. <coughs> We're hoping that January 1st, when we get a new highway superintendent, we'll be able to do those signs. That's good. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Another question okay. from the floor. <laughs> Stand up. Um, I'm Jim Underwood. I live in Laurel. I don't live on the Conic Bay Boulevard, but just off it. Um, I, I'd like to uh, change the direct where everybody here has been talking about speeding. I'm talking about the opposite. Um, I'd like to commend Chief Hagemeyer for uh, the last couple of years um, putting in the, the crossing guards or the rent cops or whatever at the end of Edgar. Uh, South Jamesport Avenue, you know, Washington, that has made it an appreciable difference. All right, um, I haven't had to go to Riverhead and take an hour and a half to get back, but part of that is because I stay home. Uh, so that has been one solution. What are some other solutions that you're looking at to speed up 25, Sound Avenue, and any of the other, uh, well, 25 and Sound Avenue, the big ones, the boulevard, seems to work a little bit better. Well, as I mentioned before, putting in the turn lane on Sound Avenue has helped greatly as far as getting the east-west traffic flowing, uh, you know, during the season. Uh, I would say the boulevard, uh, we don't really have that problem. It's really more a volume problem than anything else. So putting in a third lane there wouldn't help at all. It's just, you know, it's just the, the amount of cars that are on Pecanic Bay Boulevard. I think we also met with um, Dave and I with the DOT, and uh, they did some resetting of the timing of the traffic lights on Route 25 to try to make the traffic flow a little bit better on Route 25 as well as a uh, as a secondary uh, road. We do that to. seasonally, so we increase our green time east to west on all traffic lights mm -hmm. in the town in the town of Riverhead for the season, and then they go back to normal after. Follow up. How many summonses have been issued for the weight violation? Whether it's buses. Uh, I don't have that number. I would have to look for it. I mean, because we've all seen the buses, but it just never seems like we ever see any any of them get pulled over. <coughs> and again, uh, the previous woman spoke, and I know what you're talking about on Edgar, where the cops are moving everybody along, and we see them. Why can't they be stopped? I would have to check as far as that number is concerned. However, as I mentioned uh, to Mr. Tom McDuffie before, um, at an earlier meeting, when you're down at South Jamesport on Botanic Bay Boulevard and you get a bus there that's presenting itself 
There's really not too much you can do with that bus at that point except send them down to Cotton Bay Boulevard to get them out of there. You can't send them further down to South Jamesport to turn around because they can't do it. So, I mean, that, that's an issue. Maybe the signage at the entrance point, you know, <coughs> where you're turning to go down Edgar, maybe that would help as far as keeping buses off those roads. But have summonses been issued for weight limit violations? I would say yes. I don't have the exact number though. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Jim. Any other questions? There are other panel members here. Uh, there's uh, uh, Mr. Strong, uh, president, right. uh, president of the Mattachuck Chamber of Commerce. There's Charles Gwelly of uh, Park District. There's Doug Pearsall, uh, who owns Eastern Front, and um, Ed Harbs, who's at uh, uh, Harbs um, Farm. So are there questions in if for uh, any of those panelists? How's business? <laughs> All right, so uh, start here, stand up and, and state your name and the question. So William Crabtree, <clears throat> Hamlet of Laurel, but town of Rivet. So I come with the speeding issue because I really get the speeding before they ever get up to the Mattatuck side. But I really want to talk to you guys too because I have a question. Is your business increasing or decreasing because of the traffic that we get and that we have to deal with in Riverhead and Mattatuck? <coughs> Over the years. I'll say from the Chamber's perspective, yeah. um, we all deal with the traffic. You know, we right. have businesses here, live here as well, so it's not a, you know, uh, opposite sides of the equation, we're on the same equation. Um, the traffic is increasing, as everybody has acknowledged earlier. Generally, are businesses increasing? I would say yes, generally businesses are increasing. Um, and we're, I would say overall blessed that it is. Yes, that's a good thing. That's the a challenge is always to try and, try and uh, utilize any mitigating efforts that can be put forth from meetings like this to try and strike that balance as best as we possibly can. Exactly. So, to my second part of my question, we all want the business to be good because we want our taxes to be lower, we want more people living here, and we want everything to be perfect. It's never going to be perfect, but I noticed since, and Chief Hagemola, thank you, I, I met with you, and, and uh, the two days later I saw a Riverhead police car and there you go. <laughs> with his radar out on Pecan Bay Boulevard, and I said, that's great, thanks. And the next day, I was coming out my driveway and there was a, an unmarked car parked right in my front of my property. I said, wow, this is fantastic. So what you're saying but is was, they were responsive. Yes, they were. They, they were and, responsive. And, yeah, and I, I'd like to see more of that if we can get it. But it wasn't an unmarked car at all. It was a town of Riverhead car. And the guy was from <clears throat> code enforcement. I talked to him. But you know, nobody sped by that car. <laughs> they see it, it's got the antenna on the back, and it looks like an unmarked car, and they all slow down. So anything in that way to do, you know, to deter people. I mean, I talked to you about the old car in Southampton. Give me an old police car, put it in my driveway. Thank you for your question. Yeah. So Louise, you want to stand up and, and uh, Hi, name? I'm, I'm Louise Harrison, and I live in Peconic. And, um, really appreciate what you said, Supervisor, about South Hold um, advertising itself um, over the years. One of the things that struck me about three years ago was a fold-out tourist map. I believe it was the <coughs> North Fork Promotion, no, Promotion Council that showed the east-west roads of, of uh, the North Road and um, 25 Main Road and Peconic Bay Boulevard all <coughs> depicted on that sort of cartoony fold-out map with the same emphasis, the same yellow line, as if to say, you don't like this road, go to this road. You don't like this road, go to Peconic Bay Boulevard. That wasn't fair to the people who live on Peconic Bay Boulevard. And that, I don't know who, who the North Fork Promotion Council are, but if they're connected with the chamber uh, in any way, or there's some, uh, energy there. Um, that's something I think that 
that should be reconsidered i don't know who uses those maps and certainly anybody can go on ways or google maps and find their way to find a people or anyway but it was the intention of that that i saw in that map that i i found problematic and i know this is not a question but i was addressing what you said about um advertising i would like you to supervise to reconsider the concept of a cumulative impact study of traffic on the north fork perhaps to look at like what is the total carrying capacity of our roads what can we what can we stand that also it's not just quality of life but also for the chamber um at a certain point it's going to be detrimental to businesses when people come out here and get locked <coughs> down in their cars I think we have to look at that, and and there is always the argument of well, there, you know, there's each project has to be looked at individually, and you never know when someone might change their project. That same argument I'm familiar with because it was made in the 19 late 1980s and early 1990s with the Pine Barrens, when I worked at Suffolk County Health Department, and one week there were eight projects, the next week there were 25 projects. Ultimately, there were 234 projects that were slated for the Pine Barrens, not just in Brookhaven, but Southampton and Riverhead. All of a sudden, the Pine Barrens were going to be fully developed. And this happened in the course of about six weeks. And so we pushed for a cumulative impact analysis. And of course, a lawsuit had to be brought against the department I worked in, against Southampton, Riverhead, and Brookhaven. And ultimately, years down the road, it took another four years, but the Pine Barrens were saved. Because people realized we had to take a look at the cumulative <coughs> impacts. Everybody has traffic problems on the North Fork, in Riverhead and South Pole. It's breaking us. And this is the most spectacular place in Suffolk County. So Louise, you're asking to take another to look at the concept <laughs> of maybe a grant to look at this okay, with the town. The two towns together, Riverhead and South Hole, get together, apply for some kind of a state grant to do a, a, a build-out analysis, let's say, of, of tra a traffic build-out analysis and, and taking into account the needs of citizens as well as the needs of businesses. That, that's you, just Louise. my request. Let me, okay. let me just say a couple of things. First of all, Councilwoman Afrin and I fully support the idea of doing a multi-jurisdictional study of Sound Avenue, which would be South Hope. And if people need to remember, South Hope only owns one and a quarter miles, only has jurisdiction over one and a quarter miles of Sound Avenue, then 18 miles of Riverhead, and then the rest is, I think, is the county on the two end, uh, bookends it. So, but uh, Councilwoman Afrin, I talked, I support 100% where to try to find funds to pay for a multi-jurisdictional study of that. But at the overall picture, I get it. I think the sponge is full when it comes to tourism. But I'm going to be candid, and a lot of people aren't going to like this. What did you expect? We, you know, the Suffolk Times recently wrote an article, well, what are we going to do now because of this? Well, first of all, stop fawning over every business that shows up in the south of the town. We've been issuing vineyard permits or winery permits left and right historically. I'm not going to make them the bad guy because I think at this point they're getting too bad of a rap. People are coming out in the fall for a lot of reasons. They also think the pumpkin farms are getting a bad rap too. They're coming out for all sorts of reasons. But we've been rolling out this red carpet for years and years and years, and here we are, the victims of our own success. So, you know, that that's something that we needed to step back years ago. And I was concerned about this when I raised issues uh, a decade ago. But hey, wait a second, we don't have the infrastructure to support all of this. Well, and I called for more times and stuff. But your cumulative impact, ultimately, what are you going to do with the data? <coughs> I don't know, Scott. I, I think that this town has been bold before, and it can be bold again, and if it doesn't, this town is going down. This is a gorgeous place, and it's the last place in Suffolk County worth being. And we've got to take hold of this. <laughs> That's pretty nice too. I, 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 agree. I, I agree, and unfortunately, that's why people are coming because we've created a town that's so nice, people want to be here. 
So again, we're victims of our own success for a lot of ways. We've been promoting it uh, in terms of tourism historically here. Norfolk Promotion Council is actually a creation of South Hill Town back in 1994. I, when I became supervisor, I withdrew all the funding of the uh, group. But we've been doing that, and then also with the preservation, and all of these things, all of these successes combined together to create a town that everybody wants to be at. You know, I, so yeah, there are challenges, but I'm just, my issue that you talked about was cumulative impact studies. Ultimately, what are you gonna do? Shut down so business, shut down? So as it full as may, as it may, may, may well be. It feels full, okay? But, but if, that, if that's le legitimized by, by a study, we've got to then, we've got to pull in the brightest minds that are here in the town. Some of them are right here in this room. And we've got to we've got to do something extraordinarily bold that no other town does. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Jean. I'm sorry, just matter of fact, sir, I'm, I came in a little bit late, and uh, so as I'm repeating something that came up before, I apologize. Um, I'm addressing this basically to, to Doug as a businessman up on that lovely curve on the main road here in Mattituck, and to Scott Russell as far as what happened with traffic, because I'm sure you hear lots of accidents there, whether you've had any thoughts about what could happen if we don't get the traffic circle, and what happens, because the state wants 120 circumference, and we want 100. So what, what comes down the pipe next? And I would like to start with Doug, if you wouldn't mind, if you had some kind of thoughts, or people to come into your place of business and well, express any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we are we're literally right around the corner, and it is a blind corner, and for whatever reason, this is not directly related to that, but it seems like people get disoriented as soon as they make that right-hand turn, and they all pull over, they stop for 60 seconds, get their bearings again, and then they take off again. Um, that whole area is incredibly difficult to deal with. Everybody has you know, complaints about the, the way it is. There is no easy way to deal with it. Um, you know, I, I think... Originally, when I heard the idea of a traffic circle, I'm like, no, it's a great idea, but there'll need to be property takings, and that's 10 years, and, and you know, it will never happen. And then uh, the, the town engineer came up with an idea, okay, well, we can fit one here. So I honestly don't know if it can happen or not, but I do think it would be a great idea to add that. Um, I also think that if they, they took the end of New Suffolk Avenue, assuming you do get a traffic circle, and made it a right turn only, it would force everybody into that circle, so that way you'd be able to make a left out of New Suffolk without, you know, I mean, backing the, the people all the way up past John Carter's house. Um, but it, it's a tough spot right there, and there is no easy solution. John, that, would I like to hear from? Oh, sorry. Yeah, actually, I'm going to defer uh, to Michael Collins because he's actually been working with the state DOT, and I know Sarah and the Transportation Commission have. So I'm going to defer them uh, to them to give you an update of sort of where we are with that. So, yeah. so the, the first thing I'd like to make clear is that there's there's not a disagreement between the DOT and the town. Specifically, what the town did is commissioned a study in support of finding solutions at that intersection. The preferred solution that that study promoted was a traffic circle <coughs> at a 100 foot diameter, which is adequate for most traffic. The state, uh, at our request, reviewed the report and their, their roundabout division stated that that 100 foot diameter roundabout would not be sufficient to handle the heaviest rated traffic that is legally allowed on State Route 25. Now the fact that that particular truck traffic is very unlikely to travel east to west because you have 48, which is your preferred route, is may or may not be relevant. But the issue is right now, the state itself, we have to find a way for them to commission their own engineering study to design something that's adequate for that intersection. Until that time, there's really not so much a disagreement as one review of a report that we produced they didn't agree with one conclusion. So there's really, nothing has been settled. That, that, is, that is the exact state of where we are. Is, it, is there anybody from the state that has come down to take a look at the area? Yes, and they also, they were involved in every level of the report from draft to final. 
the next step that we're working with is to get the state DOT to actually make this a project. And then they may come to the same conclusion. They may not. There's no way to know. But they have to go through their process. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Steve. Do you have a follow-up to that? Okay. John Carter, do you have a question? Thank you. Uh, again, uh, I want to follow up on the uh, the comment about you know, a cumulative regional traffic study. Um, we understand that traffic has been an issue here for decades. We have many reports, stacks of reports that point this out. It's important that at some time, perhaps now, we stop leaning on that and stop being the victim of our own success and start addressing the challenges that are not only here, but that are coming. <laughs> they are here and they are coming. And they have been, we've known this for decades. And yet, we are still with five of the worst intersections in the town of Southfold within three blocks of here, and most of those blocks don't have sidewalks on them. When do we begin to address, as a community, as a town government, as a regional government, with state involvement, because every impression we get of state involvement on Route 25 is, ah, we can't do anything because DOT. <clears throat> Where's, am I to establish the relationship with the Department of Transportation for New York State? So John, you're, you're asking the question, why to have the partnership with the entities to come up with a solution to the success that's going on. Is that what the question is? <clears throat> what I think that for me the question is, are we or are we not from this point forward going to recognize that we have traffic issues and that those traffic issues are going to escalate and until we figure out better ways to manage it holistically with both towns. We're always gonna be behind. And there's gonna come a point, and it's as close as you suggest, it is around the proverbial corner, or we're gonna lose the goose with the golden egg. So given, given tonight's subject is about a solution orientation and what, what we're hearing between uh, Louise and, and, and you in turn, and, and that question of a cumulative, uh, a, a cumulative, is there a process that can move forward? Sarah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> obviously, uh, this has been an issue for a long time and there are lots of um, factors that we have to look at. One thing I just want to say is that recently the county has um, formed another North Fork Transportation Task Force uh, that I'm also sitting on. And I know we've done several of these in the past. Uh, both chiefs are on the commission, uh, the task force. Um, I think Supervisor Russell's in there and, and Legislator Kupski as well. Um, so, you know, this isn't something that is, no one's paying attention to. There are solutions constantly. We're trying all the time to find different solutions. This task force is made up of um, some, some people, Jonathan Keyes from the county, some other uh, people from the county. There are some, there's a representative from the state DOT, there's a representative from the MTA, um, there's promotional councils. I mean, the county really, Jonathan did a great job putting this together, really got a lot of people involved and are trying to look at other options. We know that infrastructure is, is, um, is not really a possibility. There's no, there's no possibility for us to widen the roads there. So we are having to look at other solutions. And I know it's not you know, what everybody wants to hear, and it, there's definitely not one silver bullet, but you know, they are really trying to come up with some other solutions as far as the trolley route again, or doing some other kinds of um, mass transportation of getting people in so that we're taking cars off the road. So there, there is, we've, we've had two meetings so far, 
Uh, we're meeting again, uh, I believe in January. Um, you know, so we really are working hard on, on getting this. Um, there was some talk about also the Empire State Trail with biking, uh, the Transportation Commission in Southold, we just held a, a bicycle um, forum for the community, and we're looking into that as well. So there are a lot of things that we are really trying to work on as a multifaceted approach to this. Um, and, and not just with cars, you know, trying to get more train traffic, more um, buses and trolleys and things, and, but you know, we need to get people on those as well. So it's, it's a big, big thing. It's gonna take marketing, it's gonna take a lot of um, promoting and, and getting people, you know, getting their habits to change as well. So, um, you know, I know it's not exactly the answer because it's not just the one solution that's gonna fix everything, but you know, this, this has been an ongoing thing and people are working at this, so. Thank you, Sarah, thank you. As, uh, legislative purposes. No, thank you, and, and Sarah, yeah, thanks for mentioning the, uh, the uh, County Executive Launch Task Force there to try to address the traffic. And yeah, one of the conclusions there right away is that widening the roads doesn't decrease traffic or solve your traffic problems. I was on the expressway today and it's a pretty wide road and it's pretty horrific. So that doesn't that's not the solution. But to, to Louise's point, um, Louise, you know, it is kind of you can you can kind of see it coming if you're south old town. But um, the land preservation program is very important. Most of the farmland uh, it, that exists today is in Riverhead and South Old Town. So in response to that, the county executive put $100 million in the capital program for the next 10 years. And we passed it unanimously after a lot of, uh, a, a little bit of hard work this fall in our capital program. So that's money dedicated towards farmland preservation. The county also has a, uh, a land preservation program that addresses both farmland preservation and open space. So anytime you preserve that land, you are, you can't address the, that doesn't address the, the or visitor traffic, but it addresses the day-to-day -day traffic, right? And, and the town, of course. potential future problems. It, it does exactly eliminate future problems yeah. because they don't exist because you didn't have 50 cars coming out of that intersection anymore you have two a day or two an hour or whatever and the town has the you know one of the best land preservation programs um you know on long island also right. so so they keep they keep chipping away at it and they keep making a difference too and you don't see that difference because it doesn't it, the problem doesn't exist well, so you have to keep supporting that effort because that's really and if you look at some of the efforts on some of the corners, and we're talking about the main road mostly here and the traffic, you know, within the, the, the bad intersections that are busy here. But if you look at the North Road in South Hold, a lot of the corners at those intersections, they're not developed. And that's for a reason. That's because one couple came out here and they lived in Peconic and they preserved, they bought that business zoning those those commercial the commercial zone parcels on the corners on the intersections and they preserve them and so you'll never have an application for some sort of business there that's going to then become uh, a traffic problem because that intersection is now is super busy and so all those efforts are done you don't see you don't really see it because you're driving past it because there's no traffic there I totally so, agree with so you, open space preservation. Yeah. Oh, I know you, know you do. About me. I know you do, but you have to keep, you have <laughs> but, to keep pushing that But I have an you idea to, to expand on what you're saying, and I've had this idea for a long time. It's crystallizing a little bit more as I sit here, which is that you know we, the county, the town, we all have these lists of criteria for open space preservation. Does it, does it, does it have? Um, wetlands, does it have this, does it have, they go down the checklist, oh, this, is, this has all the qualities we want, let's buy it, right? Let's add traffic abatement to the list. Why don't we consider floating a bond for a new open space preservation fund called the Traffic Abatement Open Space Preservation Fund? Everybody would probably throw money at that, okay? If we knew that you know, oh, it's not a very beautiful forest, it doesn't have, that's okay, it, that, you buy that, you preserve that, you're eliminating 10 future homes with, with, with a car for every teenager. And that could, that could at least help create more of a holding pattern. And you may, I think Scott is right, where the sponge is, is saturated. 
I don't think we can do much else until we, you know, it's going to start bleeding all over us. And um, I'm, I'm totally in favor of open space preservation as a form of traffic control. Totally 100%. And every time we buy a parcel, that's exactly what we do. So it, we do, we take, we move, remove cars from the road every single day, every right. time I sit down and sign a deed, taking conservation uses. But I have a feeling that when I say the sponges rules, that what the public wants to hear right now is saying, enough is enough, we're gonna stop the cars from coming out. And you have to be realistic. It's just not gonna happen. Now, I wanna just touch on what Sarah Napa had talked about a little a while ago. They actually, the town, East End Transportation Commission existed years ago. All the towns, all the villages, we did a study called the Volpe Study. And what we do was we said, look, we're gonna try to figure out what we need to do to create public transportation, um, or, or, you know, rail, uh, uh, trains, buses, the whole thing, this hybrid system. And they came up with the cost figure. Uh, the cost figure at the time, unfortunately, the scenario required that we receive or got the infrastructure from the MTA the income that gets generated from the East End and gets sent to the MTA, and all these different caveats to make it happen. And I think the original startup cost was $90 million, though some people thought that was a fifth of what it would actually cost. And then annual operation would be 40 to 50 million, subsidized by the income that was generated from this fund. And Albert was on the town board with me at the time. Um, I, the, the, realistically, um, it's, go, it's gonna change, it has to change habits. People aren't used to using public transportation. Secondly, a lot of what was in that study isn't gonna happen. The MTA is never gonna give us their rails. They're ne certainly never gonna give us the income that gets generated for the MTA, most of which gets spent in the metropolitan area <coughs> to keep the rates down there. That's, that's, that was the problem with the Volpe study. It said, hey, this is what you can do. Presume you can do this, 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 and this. The problem is that list of four or five things, we couldn't do. It's beyond our control and beyond feasibility. Uh, stand up, stand okay, name. Thank you, John. That starts from Laurel. Uh, my question is, what other than standard law enforcement measures are we doing to stop DWI in South Hold and in Riverhead? Are we working with the breweries and the vineyards? Are we educating citizens and children in high school? Is there anything we're doing to stop DWI other than just kind of standard law enforcement? Well, we do. Um, obviously, a lot of it's enforcement by our officers that are out there working on the roads. Uh, we do get uh, money through New York State for stop DWI funds that puts extra officers out on the road um, that are looking strictly for DWIs. Um, I think we get about nineteen thousand dollars. You probably get more, Dave, but we get about yeah, we get about nineteen thousand dollars per year for the uh, for the overtime for that. Um, but that's where most of our uh, efforts are concentrated on on extra patrols and DWI patrols for um, you know for the evening hours, holidays, that type of thing. Sad part of that is that money has not increased probably over the last 30 years. Yeah. It's been the same. We got $25,000 30 years ago, we're getting $25,000 in 21. So that's, that's sad because the salaries have gone up, you know, in every 30 years. So. Are we working on like, uh, with breweries and vineyards, we have an economy that's at least partially based on vineyards and breweries and it's fantastic. Uh, are we working with them to prevent uh, people being overserved or? Uh, uh, our, in, in Riverhead, we have Riverhead CAP Community Awareness Program. So they're all they're in our schools. So they they talk about underage drinking and we we and stuff like that. So they cover that end of it. They also do tips training for every brewery, bar, whatever, any event that's going on in Riverhead. They'll tips train all the servers so they're aware on how to serve people or how to stop. Serving. We also push out a lot of that in our DARE programs that we bring through all the schools. Um, and working with the SLA, I mean, we, we've done, when we, you know, when we uh, identify a place, I mean, look at all we went through with Vineyard 48 to close that because it was being grossly, um, you know, grossly abused as far as uh, feeding people uh, drinks. Um, a lot of it, I mean, just uh, the limousine companies and a lot of, a lot less people are driving out here, I think, and uh, getting intoxicated at the wineries, at least, because there's so many other um, modes of transportation that they're taking out here. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's most of it. And, um, yeah, well, we're, doing, we're doing compliance checks all the time, yeah. which is, our CAP also helps fund those, so. The Wine Council also provides tips training, and a lot of the employees from the winery take tips training. So when you're seeing like a, like a 
people belong in 2-5 or a 3-2? Is, is it your sense that they're not at the vineyards, they're at private parties, or they're, they're at home, or some other? I don't think that's a lot of, uh, I don't think that's a lot of winery trade or more. It's uh, people that are drinking at homes, or uh, maybe some in a bar, some obviously have alcohol issues uh, before they even come into. Just to give you an example, we, uh, we used to do stop D we um, weekends, um, two or three years ago, when the DA's office used to fund a lot of that through asset forfeiture before the, the laws changed in asset forfeiture, and one of the one of Salvo's weekends was I always chose um, Labor Day weekend because the winery business starts uh, getting heavier. There's a lot of people out here. Or actually, no, it wasn't. I'm sorry, it was Columbus Day weekend, and we set up a, um, a checkpoint up by 48 and Cox Neck Road with probably and so, so these task force were. Uh, there's offices from Riverhead there, Southampton there. Is the, everybody combines together at one location. So this was our turn in Southall for uh, for that location. Um, and I went up there for it for the entire evening. Um, as we were standing outside there, we had it all set up with, uh, you know, the first officer greets the car, gets a spell inside the car. If he smells any kind of booze, you go over to a separate line. Your field sobriety tested there. The whole thing was set up very well. I think we came up with one ability impaired. We figured we would be hitting the wine industry with the people leaving on the weekend. Um, we got more of the busloads of people driving by, obviously drunk, but yelling out the windows at us when they're going by. But uh, a lot, a lot of the, um, uh, we, I just thought we would get a lot of, a lot more of uh, DVs on that. And, and like I said, we, and I think we screened over 130 cars, 140 cars, something like that, and we just didn't come up with them. We did four check. Uh, checkpoints Thanksgiving Eve. We only came up with one deal. I think we, we gave out like, a, I don't know, what stop like a thousand cars or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Came up with one deal. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So there are three questions. So G, Harry, and Chris. So G. So I just wanted to follow up about that because uh, my understanding is there's no test for proving whether somebody is intoxicated from marijuana, Riverhead Town is opted in. I don't know what South Old Town is <coughs> opt in or opt out, but even so, anybody in South Old Town can go to Riverhead Town. There are going to be retail operations. There are going to be, I don't know, lounges, I suppose, where people can smoke. But there is nothing in, in fact, I understand is coming down the pike with a vehicle traffic law about what you do about somebody who is intoxicated from smoking pot, yeah. or using pot for that matter. So is there anything in the works? Is there? I think they're working on um, trying to come up with different types of testing. I mean, obviously with alcohol, there's definitive tests where you can, uh, we have alert tests that we give on the side of the road, and, and um, toxilizer tests that give you an exact amount of blood alcohol um, level, ethanol level. Um, with marijuana, we don't have, not that we can't arrest somebody that we think is impaired by using marijuana, because we can still do that. It's a little bit harder to prove or why, uh, you know, we'd have to find marijuana in the car or, you know, the driver admitted to just smoking marijuana, maybe something like that. Um, and we made one arrest um, with, uh, right when they, I think Massachusetts started uh, legalizing with a, uh, um, the driver had been um, using gummies, marijuana gummies, and took one, didn't feel anything from it, you know, figured, well, let me take a second one because maybe it wasn't working. So, like two miles later, she flipped her car and uh, was arrested for a DUI. She, I think, she had kids in the car too. It, it's, um, you know, so it can still be done, but it's a little bit harder to to, uh, to put that on a driver. All right. If we feel they're impaired, their ability is impaired to drive, we can arrest them. Mm -hmm. We're proving that on the side of it that we come to this place. Harry. Again, mine's not going to be extremely re relatively quick. Um, it's not a question, but. I know it's been stated before that you feel the speeding on every other road and how to save all the roads no different. Um, since we are now main road number two and we are now a bypass, just letting you know, everybody that wants to hide, the drunk drivers, the intoxicated people that are high on marijuana, high on whatever they're on, one, you can smell it when you come down our road sometimes. It's whatever. Um, two, we're the ones that are witnessing the people going over the double yellow line. We are the ones witnessing, you know, the people swerving in that. Because we're, what are they trying to do? They're trying to avoid it. We have over 40 wineries. 
brewery, restaurant, where everybody is drinking in a very, very small area. And they're gonna go down every side road to avoid you know, RPD at any cost. And one of their getaways is Peconic Bay Boulevard. Someone is going to die, a pedestrian. People walk on the road. I leave at 5.30 in the morning to go to work. There are people walking their dogs. There are people out. When I'm, you know, I live there. People are walking on the road at 10, 11 o'clock at night, especially when the weather is nice. <coughs> you have people that are drunk. And this is very dark. Didn't somebody from UPS or FedEx just get hit the other day? Amazon. And it was Amazon? They did. Probably one of my deliveries. I thought it was great. But um, they said that that's because that was dark, right? And that's main road? Mm -hmm. Yes. Think about that. Now you're on Peconic Bay Boulevard. It is dark, it is windy, it is narrow. There is no shoulder, there is no margin for error. We really need to stop the flow of traffic, stop using our road, and I know that you said that there was a beautiful map, you know, with the thinking that you could take Peconic Bay Boulevard. There is. And another person that allows that to happen is Doug Deed on U12. We need to stop <laughs> promoting some of these businesses and we need to stop getting, you know, news 12 out here to promote all the farms. People know about it. But now this road is way too narrow. Now you have drunk, you have people that are distracted. I was watching a limo coming down the road like this with his phone straddling the double yellow line, heading at me, coming home from work, looking back at his patrons in the back. They're not paying attention, and we all know we've had horrific <coughs> limo accidents out here. So I'm just saying, <coughs> Peconic Bay is a little bit different, and we do have a lot of, you know, thank you. Well, driving. Just so you know, I said before that you have a lot of similar, I did recognize that you are a little bit unique because you became a third by this. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just saying, as a whole, I really need to emphasize it because I've watched way too many close calls and the one thing that did start me on this is when I was putting up my privacy hedges in the back, in the front, somebody was riding their bike and he had a little trailer with his baby in the back. Was he riding on the wrong side of the road? Yes, but that's besides the point. A limo came this close to him. He was knocked off the bike. He was knocked onto the lawn. Nobody would have been able to get to that baby. So there is no room for all of this extra traffic to be on this road. Yes, does it impede <coughs> our lives? Yes, does it decimate our quality of life? 100%, but I'm, I'm letting you know, it is beyond dangerous and someone is going to die. And I, I would rather be proactive than reactive because I'm letting you know that if something does go down, like in Trois or U12, wherever it was, the lawsuit's gonna come to the town. And then eventually, who has to pay for that? The taxpayers. So I really just need you to take that into consideration as well.